Today's topic of debate is um, do we need specialisms in design? Um, and the two people that we've got speaking today are um, Leora Smith, who's a service designer, and she, her point of view is that yes, very much we do need to specialise within a certain area within design, and Leora has specialised in service design, so she's going to speak a little bit about service design and then talk about why she thinks we do need to focus in on one particular area. Um, and the other speaker is Eta Martinvesi, who um, has the opposing view that no, you, design is a kind of general um, set of skills that can be applied to a broad range of um, areas. I hope yeah. I paraphrase that correctly. So we're going to um, start with Lior, who's going to give a presentation, and then Eta is going to give a presentation, and then we'll um, try and get a, a debate going between the two, us and you in this room, okay? All right, so let's start with your Hello. Thank you. Um, so, are you on Twitter? No. Do you want to know? Do you, do you have internet access? Yes. Yeah. Okay, well, if you do tweet this event, um, it's at your Smith. And what's the? At the NID, DI debates. I think you all know the Yes, DI debates. DI debates. Yeah. So it was interesting to have like a Twitter conversation yeah. at the same time talk. I'm really finally looking at your phone at the same time as me talking, that's fine. But if you take a picture of me, please tag me. <laughs> um, so, okay, so I'm going to talk about what service design is and I'll break down what skills you need to, skills involved in being a service designer so you get a better understanding of it. Can I have a show of hands of who's heard of service design? <laughs> wow, okay, great. So that's like four people, so you're going to find out loads more about service design today. I hope you enjoy it. So, um, <coughs> service design. So basically it's a new industry, it's a new design industry, and it's described in many different ways by the different agencies that are working in service design, according to who they want their clients to be. Um, but the way I describe it is, it's um, applying a design process to designing a service. So, um, this is one someone else's <coughs> definition. When you have two coffee shops right next to each other and each sells the exact same coffee at the exact same price, service design is what makes you walk into one and not the other. So basically, a service can be anything from a coffee shop to an airport lounge for business customers to get their clothes dry clean while they're waiting for the plane, or it could be a council service like how do you help young people in foster care to learn how to do the ironing even though they don't have stable parent figures? So a service could be anything, really. Um, well, it was a service, though, not a physical product. Um, and I got interested in service design because I was starting to look at social needs rather than consumerist needs. So I thought, I don't, I don't know if a product's always the best solution um, to some social needs. But I started out as a furniture and product designer. So um, if service design is the process of applying the design process to designing a service, what's the design process? So um, I don't know if you have the same experience of what design is as I do, because I studied furniture, as I said, and you guys are in design interactions, right? So um, I'd really be interested to know if your experience is similar to mine later on in the debate. So the way I learned how to design things was I, was, I did some research when I analysed that research, then I came up with lots of different ideas. I made some prototypes, I test, tested them, like modified the prototypes, tested them again, modified them again, tested them again, until I came up with something which really fitted the user needs. Is that kind of what you do? Yeah, yeah? okay, that's good, great, great. So um, this is how the design council explain what design is, and they just use it for like everything. So at the beginning, it's divergent. So you discover lots of things, you research lots of different things. Then you have a feasibility review where you say, okay, well, these are the bits of research that are important. So let's define a brief now. That's the brief bit. Then you have <coughs> lots of different ideas, divergent again. Then you have a concept review where you work out which of the ideas are really great. And you define that, you kind of develop that idea until you reach a delivery point. So they describe that as design for everyone for every kind of um, design process. So um, this next one, this is, I worked in a council in an innovation lab and we needed to explain to them what design was. So we developed 
our own way of describing what design was that would help people in the council understand it. So it's really similar. What we discover bit, sorry the green's a bit um, pale on this background, but discover is basically the research. Design is coming up with lots of ideas. Develop is a prototyping, and then you go around designing and prototyping until you decide what you want to do. And at this stage in the council was quite long actually, deciding what you want to do for a long time. Until we then we got to the deliver, delivery bit where we actually delivered the services <coughs> to the residents. So does that all make sense so far? Mm -hmm. yes. yes. Good. Good. Yeah. Can you hear me at the back, by the way? Yeah, cool. So now I'm going to tell you a few examples that will illustrate what service design is, how it works. So this was uh, a second year project I did, and it was the first thing that I did to, <coughs> it's the first service design project I did. I didn't even know that I was doing service design at the time. I was looking at um, isolated young mothers that didn't have families near them, and I was looking at like, isolated <coughs> older people they didn't have families near them, and I thought, why not just put them both together, get them to meet each other and form communities, and that will mean that both their social needs are kind of solved. So I came up with adopted grandma, which is that connecting up older people without families, families are older people around them. Um, and it really stretched what I understood design to be. I was thinking, can I look at social needs rather than if old men got handbags? Um, can I can I stretch what design is? Can I, can I design something which isn't physical? Um, and I found that I could. And even though my tutors were saying, like, what, how is this design? We don't really understand it. I now realize that I was applying a design process to something which was a bit intangible. That still makes it design. Um, yeah. And also, I didn't do these illustrations, so that made it even harder for me to answer that question because I wasn't creating the physical output but I came up with the solution that would meet those needs. This is another one. So this was Kensington and Chelsea Circle. Um, this was designed by older people for older people, and it basically connected up older people in local areas to each other, so they weren't, they weren't isolated. And um, they've got activity packs through the post every month where they could um, they could find out if there were any local meetups for them. They could go and uh, do some health and well-being, like things like walks and yoga. Um, they could uh, call up um, Circle Central and say, I need someone to help me put up my shelves. So it met a number of different needs for older people. Um, and that's like one of the things that's often when you talk to um, bureaucrats, they recognise this as service design most easily. Um, because it's basically it's a service that meets needs very clearly. Um, so uh, what I so also this might be okay. One minute. So I, Kensington and Chelsea Circle is just one of the circles. I, I got brought in to develop the circle model for that particular borough. So um, I re did some research to find out what how people in Kensington and Chelsea were different from other boroughs. Um, and what I found was that actually they had loads of services already available to them, but what they didn't have was someone to kind of match up specialised needs. So, for example, I matched up someone who wanted to see a really particular film with someone that did film screening them. It was a beautiful thing. If you're interested, it's circlecentral.com. Um, so this is a more recent service. This is called Lantern. It's basically um, a web app that signposts um, older people to services in their local area. Um, and it was designed by Future Girls in partnership with Surrey County Council. Um, basically what happens at the moment is, is if you're an older person and you call up um, the council and you say, um, I've broken my hip, uh, I need some help <coughs> from you, they take about two months to respond, and that's two months when they can't really move about very much. So if their family member can go on Lantern and check out what's what, what kind of help is available for them uh, in the local area. It means that they can get help immediately and it means that the council saves money. Uh, I'll come more on to Lantern about how we came up with that idea later. Would you like this picture? So this is uh, what a council chamber looks like. It's pretty much, that's how they look, they all look basically. The main difference is the moustaches. 
Um, so, what, um, what is the value of the service design approach compared to traditional methods? Why, why get service designers to come into uh, large organisations such as councils? Well, um, what generally tends to happen is that if you're a council officer and you need to make a new service, you look at some data, some quantitative data, that's the numbers, and then you kind of say, well, this will probably work, let's allocate this much money to it. Then they stage the decision in a meeting like this, um, then they roll it out, and then sometimes it doesn't work. So what's wrong with that process? Well, what I think is wrong with it is that they don't test things, so they don't pilot things, and they don't consult people to see if it will actually work for them. They don't say, here's this idea, what do you think? So they don't prototype. And they don't come up with a divergent range of ideas either because they're not in a very creative environment. So that's where we can really help as designers. We can help them be creative. Um, I'm so passionate about this, can you tell? <laughs> um, so, um, yeah. Okay, I'm lost my notes. Yeah. So basically, if we can if we can pilot things and if we can talk to people about it, if we can even get ideas from the end users, that's even better. Okay, so uh, what design skills do you need? So these are some skills that I think most designers need which you use in service design. So generally you need to be creative, you need to have ideas, uh, you need to have a certain level of visual communication to communicate your ideas, uh, you need to have a really deep understanding of the design process so you can leave it if necessary. So when you when you, have, you go and seek inspiration, you do you do mood boards and that kind of thing? Yeah? So that's important to do. Um, you kind of know when you need to do more research. You know when you say you know when like you don't have the right ideas yet. You know, okay, I need to get some more ideas. You have a feel for that. Um, so those all those things are really important for being a service designer. But on top of that you need some extra service design skills. So do designers need specialisms? Well, Lou asked me this question. The first thought that came to my mind is that um, we got an, an illustrator to come in and do some co-design with us, some service design. And he, even though he explained it, he just didn't really get it. So I think, I think it is necessary to have some experience and a depth of skills in certain specialisms in order to do the job well. Um, so now I'm going to break down what skills you need um, as a service designer in particular. Can I have a hands up who's heard of design thinking? Okay. Cool, that's good. So, um, design thinking is basically the process, and you can change my definition if you want um, over there. But it's basically the process of design with a particular focus on user needs. Um, so the way I describe it to people that aren't designers is, um, if you're a product designer and you're designing a mug for someone with arthritis, you're going to really do your research on how they grip mugs so that they fit your mug over anyone else's mug so you get the money and you, it's a successful design. So the same thing in services, you really have to do your research and t test things thoroughly in order to make sure that you've got a really good design, and that's design thinking that bounce. If you're interested in that in particular, Google Tim Brown from IDEO, because he's got loads of information about design thinking. Um, and the first time I realized that this might not be like a universal thing within design was this year at Clarkmore Design Week. I went to this talk, and there's this guy here, he's a furniture designer. He said, I don't care about design thinking, I don't care about user needs, it gets in the way of me designing beautiful chairs, it gets in the way of my vision. And for me, I was totally outraged because that's not where I understand to be design at all. Um, but yeah, so I think that design thinking is really integral to service design. So um, another thing in service design is co-design. Um, this is when you get together a group of stakeholders and you come up with ideas together. So you look at the brief, you kind of dissect it, get a better understanding of the problem, then you come up with ideas together. So it's really important in making sure that the ideas are relevant. Um, so for example, Lantern I mentioned earlier, the way we did that was we got together council officers, policy makers, um, frontline staff in care homes, 
and we really should have got some older people in as well and their families but what we did was we dissected the problem we realized how little funding there was for older people um, and how far we need to change things and then we came up with lots of different ideas and one of those ideas was lantern um, and if you're interested in this, you can do this yourself. You can organise pre design sessions yourself in your projects if you want to. All you need is people that are interested in, in what you're making right now. And uh, if you look on DIY Toolkit, there are loads of tools in there for you to help, to help you kind of work out how to run a session like that. And you end up getting some really rich ideas from that sort of process. Um, so, oh yeah. So customer journey mapping is another skill which I think is quite specific to service design. Um, this is a scribble that I did during um, work the other day. Um, basically, it's like storyboarding for experiences rather than films. Um, you kind of imagine how a user uses your service, and that helps you work out where there are problems and where you need to develop things better. Um, and it describes your, process, your service really well, and it describes it to everyone that needs to um, deliver your service. Um, and I think that uh, communication with non-designers is also, it's not totally specific to service design, but it really, really helps because often you work with people who aren't designers at all. So you need to really explain what design is to them from the basics. And it also really helps to have some visual communication to help you do that. Um, these guys here, this was an innovation lab in a council. That guy is a policy maker, that's a guy in risk assessment, that's a guy in finance. And we ended up talking about um, outdoor gyms and how to charge your mobile phone with outdoor gyms. <coughs> and it really helped that I could take what they were saying and put it on the wall, the whiteboard wall, um, so that they could bounce ideas off around it. So whether you're communicating with designers or non-designers, I really think that but as far as I understand, visual communication skills is something that runs through all designers' practice. Um, and I'd be happy for you to disagree, and I'd love to know what you guys think as well. Um, it's something that not everyone has, and you probably don't even realise how important it is until you start talking to non-designers, because they'll just talk without getting anything down at all. So if you can draw things out and diagram things out, it really helps other people get a greater understanding of what they are even talking about, and it enables a deeper, deeper level of thought. Um, sorry, I'm coming down with a cold, so I have to try that other kind of design as well. I made that superhero cape. And I'm never going to make a cape ever again. Like, I do not like working with satin. It is so fiddly and tricky. And like, after that, I'm just not going to be making any, I'm not going to be a fashion designer. It's just not me. And I'm happy for that. <laughs> and it's totally fine to be doing that. I'm quite happy to leave other kinds of design, like furniture design, um, yeah, fashion design, or I don't know, engineering, that kind of thing, to people that really enjoy working with the materials they need to work with. What I'm good at is designing experiences and I'm interested in social needs. So for me, service design is right for me. <coughs> so what is design about service design? It's the process is a design process, as I've explained. So for me, that's what's designerly about it. Is there anything that isn't designerly about service design? Well, <coughs> Uh, change management um, is a thing that I learned about quite recently. When you're a service designer working with people who aren't designers, you have to persuade them that your idea is really good and that they should implement it. And unfortunately, so you have to kind of spend a lot of time in meetings, non-design meetings, and that's called change management. And it's really, other people can do that job, but if, if it's your idea and your concept that you're pushing, sometimes you need to be in those meetings. It's the kind of bad side of service design that no service designer wants to do. Sorry. Um, how does service design fit into the design world? Well, actually, service design seems to be more closely linked to social enterprise because a lot of social ent entrepreneurs want to use service designers in their startups. 
Um, but I think that service design should be more closely linked to other design disciplines. So I ran this, this event during the London Design Festival, um, and it was um, a few talks um, from some great speakers about how they, how they design services, as well as a workshop. Um, and the result was that more people wanted to be service designers and more companies wanted to hire service designers. So it grew the industry. And as I said earlier, it's a new industry. It's still small. It's, there are, there's lots of competition for jobs. And if you're interested in service design, you have to really, really believe in it and believe that you will get that job. Otherwise, I'd say, go and do something else for a while and build some experience somewhere else before coming back into service design because it's so competitive and hard. Um, sorry, that sounds kind of doom and gloom. <laughs> but it will get there. Service design is really going to change things. Uh, if you're interested, here are some more resources. I can send you that link. Yeah. Um, so th this is service design thinking. Oh, that one. <laughs> okay. This is service design thinking. is a really useful book. Um, it's DIY tools that I mentioned earlier. It's some great resources over there. Um, Nesta do some great talks. Uh, design against crime is sort of service design that's based here. And um, one person to talk to as well as Matt Malpass. And there are some post-grad courses, but they're still new. I'm, I'm not totally a big fan of all of them yet. They'll be developing great. What are the future jobs first days? Uh, that's a new thing. So mm -hmm. they, it's mainly about innovation in, in the councils. Okay. Um, but it is really interesting. And I'm sure they would be interested in having some creative students there mm -hmm. to like, add their voice mm -hmm. to them. <coughs> So I'm just going to end on this question. If you do see yourself as a designer, what kind of designer are you? And for me, that's the same time. Like when I was 19, I thought I was going to be a furniture designer forever. Like I'd be the next little busier, but it didn't happen because I found I was interested in other things. Um, so for me, I'm a service designer today. What kind of designer are you? <laughs> studying here a few years ago. After that, I did a master's at RCA, and now I've been working at the Times. Uh, <laughs> I've been labeled as editorial designer, because I do a lot of print stuff. But somehow, I think, in my head, it says no. Because I'm a graphic designer. Uh, so, this is my personal approach, and it's going to overlap a lot to what was just said. Because uh, I don't think there are sort of black and white in these things, there are lots of grey areas. Uh, but for me, all design is service design. Uh, we are basically living in a world which is come uh, from sort of mechanical background to a social uh, society. And we're still in a uh, world where we need uh, sort of labeling and put words to things in order to understand them. But in, in a certain extent, 
sorry, I have to do it this way because I can't see what I'm doing. <coughs> uh, to a certain extent, uh, right, sorry. Uh, Yeah, so uh, let me regroup. We have a human tendency of labeling things. Uh, so in order to understand, we have to kind of put words to, uh, behind what we are uh, doing. But this, to me, creates a lot of problems. Um, from this mechanical background, there's always been sort of idea of a designer that uh, you're meant to be able to design uh, sort of variety of things. And Austrian designer ar uh, and an architect, Argo Flores, used to say that architects are meant to be able to design everything from a spoon to a city. Uh, of course, it's a big sort of w wide span to design everything from a spoon to a c city. Uh, but in this sort of social realm, I, I kind of feel that it's a relevant statement. Yeah. Design is sort of problem solving, or it's seen as a problem solving. Which leads to something which is defining a set of uh, specific outcomes. For example, as a designer I've been asked, can you do a logo? Uh, that brief already defines my outcome. So I'm not really addressing a problem properly. I am addressing a problem of uh, how to do a logo. I'm not addressing a problem of what's really needed. So for me, design is more about communication, uh, not about specific sort of uh, definition of an outcome. Uh, and communication is up to interaction and communication is about people and that's why I said that everything is social and everything is about uh, relationships. Uh, communication and designing communication is understanding human to human relationships and how human uh, humans interact with objects. So it's not just one or the other. But traditionally, especially because we come from a mechanical background, it's understood very much as, uh, as an uh, sort of human to object relationship. Uh, but I feel that it's, it's completely changing now. And our understanding of design is widening. So I see design uh, as our overall medium. Design is a tool. It's not, again, design is not about the specific physical outcome, for example. Uh, well, of course, modern world is also very complex. Uh, so we are living in a system society, uh, network society, where everything links to everything which leads to situations where if I only know my specific area, I don't know the area that sits next to it. So it's very important for me to understand, for example, if I'm designing a website, uh, what the content of the website, for example, news, how the news operate on a traditional form like print, but if it translates to websites, how does that uh, same communication translate to different medium. And also this sort of systems th thinking and networking requires lots of openness because you might be looking at one corner of a network but you're kind of excluding everything else. So again, a logo might not be the right answer. But of course, when we de define things, uh, and understand things through definition, just leaving everything open becomes a big problem. And for example, me selling myself the pro prospective client becomes very difficult if I just say, well, I can design everything from the spoon to the city, because they don't know what they're buying from me. Uh, 
But again, I rather say that I'm a graphic designer who understands content and communication, and the communication is the content bit. Excuse for uh, spelling mistake there. There's another N here, but you can just see. <laughs> yeah. So basically, this openness just requires a lot more from a designer. Uh, you need to have a wider set of skills and apply a broader sense of design thinking. But it's also about then understanding when you're not the right person to do things when you need to consult, when you get somebody else to work with you and build relationships. Uh, and for example, for me, service design as a label is something that is kind of managing this uh, set of sort of different areas of design. But for me, it's still a label that we've kind of attached on top on something that is required at the moment. But for me, design as a whole operates like that already, or it should operate. So my key is the communication, and as a graphic designer, I design communication. I don't design a specific outcome. And hence, I argue that as a graphic designer, I want to be called graphic designer, <laughs> not something random, or not something too specific, because I want to leave the openness there. For example, uh, if I'm only an editorial designer, how can I design an exhibition identity? I haven't slept for three days pretty much because we have been designing, a <laughs> design, uh, uh, designing an identity for an exhibition that launched yesterday. And under a title, editorial designer, I'm, I'm not allowed to touch that. That's not my field. But a graphic designer can easily work on this. So that's about me. I'm sorry for the hazy start. <laughs> okay, maybe we can get the speakers sitting there a little bit and we can try and start a, a bit of a discussion. Find things in order to understand them, but because communication is quite complex, we still don't understand them, and therefore I feel that it's almost irrelevant <laughs> to a certain extent how we define it, because it's still kind of leaving broader perspective of operating. Can I ask a question? Do you feel like you know what service design is? Hands up! Now that I've told you about it. Yay! Yeah, yeah. <laughs> like communication. Okay. It, maybe it's a seven out of ten. <laughs> What's so it? it's not totally <coughs> awful. So then it, I, I did give a label to service design because that, that gives us a common language over, so we can just understand that more. I, I just, if, if people don't understand what service design is, that might just be because they 
haven't found out what it is yet doesn't mean that they have heard about it and they didn't understand mm. because of the communication with that. Does that, does that make sense? Yeah, come on. Somebody wanted to say something. Can I ask something about service design? Yeah. What wasn't clear to me is, um, do you design the concept of it or the visuals of it or both? Do you design like the website that's related to that? Do you design the, the whole look, the typeface and everything? Or is it is that handed over to someone else, and like a graphic designer, and just the service, and the idea of the service designed by yourself? So that depends on what the budget is. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I can design websites, I can do graphics, etc. Um, but if, if I, I design a service which needs some kind of expertise that I don't have, I'll outsource that. So, and when I've worked within agencies, um, often I'll, I'll just design the service bit because there are other people that can do the graphics. But then again, because I can do graphics, I end up prototyping them as I go. So then I, yeah, I guess I have had experience doing lots of different things. So if I need to, I can make props and stuff. Does that make sense? So basically, if you, if you have loads of money, you can just have one person that that there were a few people that do the service design bit, and then other people that produce the outcomes. But if you're a one-man band, yeah, so basically it depends. And I have somebody to define what service. So I think in order, to, in order to understand what service design, I need to understand what service, and I think that as a term, for me, service becomes, for example, that I'm going to the shop and I get served. But I find it really difficult as a term to understand what is a service and how do we define it? And you guys jump to a immediately on a website. How does it look on a print? Well, is that a service or not? So where do we define these borders? Good question. Does somebody want to say something? Um, I think kind of service design breaches uh, kind of past kind of uh, visual design in such a way. Like you think about if you go into a supermarket, the way that that supermarket has been laid out, what is on the shelves, at what height, kind of the length of the aisles, how long everything is, the time it takes for you to get from inside the store to the checkout, which adverts you see and when. I think that can also be service design. So it's not necessarily something that kind of necessarily helps people, but I think it's also equally as valuable as kind of branding, communication, uh, a logo, website, as to kind of how the customer experiences, say, your shop, or I mean, even your website, that can be service design that you have the design elements, but the actual user interface could be classed as uh, service design. Yeah, but to go to that, I think the biggest problem with, for example, graphic design has is that you are faced with the brief, for example, design a new cereal packaging for us because we're not being sold enough, you know. And that is kind of cornering yourself because you're not necessarily responding to the correct problem, which might be that exactly, for example, the placement in there and I think we're kind of walking up to this world. But to me, it's not to say that I don't think we need service design. I think we really need it. My argument would be that we need it because we don't understand anymore what design does. And design is about looking at your overall problem. And the problem is that the thing doesn't sell, for example. And, and the design process has sort of jumped to the actual execution before it even starts that research. And what, what about in a process where, like for example, I, I've worked with graphic designers, mm. and I've, 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 I've been the one that's been looking at the social needs, and then I'll say, okay, now I really understand what the need is, I need a graphic designer to help me fulfill that need. Mm. And I explain to them exactly what we need, and, and she or he just does the graphic bit. Is that valid in your opinion? I just, because I, all I want is her or him to just do the graphic. And I don't, I don't actually need to pay for his or her time. Yeah, well, uh, I think that's about understanding where you sit in a project, you know. Mm -hmm. Of course, when, for example, I've been art directing people who suddenly decide that, you know, they're no longer graphic designers and we do something else. That's not operating in a project that you're working in at that point. But these questions should be asked before you go there, for example, like mm -hmm. before the person starts doing the visuals, are the visuals needed, for example. Yeah. So, but no, I don't, for example, I'm not going to my day job and saying, let's no more, let's not do the supplements, you know, because I'll be biting my own leg as well. Yeah. <laughs> I get paid by doing that. Uh, yeah, well, I think there's so many levels, of course, for example, uh, you know, 
running a specialized design studio that only does print, you're not gonna at tomorrow start, you know, guiding all your clients to go somewhere else. Mm -hmm. So the system is so much more complex how we operate. I mean, one thing that I was thinking while the two of you were talking was that, as far as I understand, that the idea of taking the design process to, say, a council is a relatively new idea. Is that right? Yeah. yeah. So I guess it's a kind of land grab by designers to say, right, okay, we can use what we've got, but we'll just step out and put our flag there in the middle of the council and now say, okay, invent this thing called service design and say, okay, we're design applying design principles to these new these areas where previously there have been other um, methods of, of working. So I wonder if in the process of doing that, to be able to convince people that that's a good idea, you have to invent the label and say, this is service design, because otherwise people will just be like confused about what what are you doing? And actually, what, what they ask for at the moment is innovation. And innovation is like, people get scared when you say the word innovation because it sounds like magic. Mm. So, no, and how do you have a process for innovation? Well, like for me, the design process is the closest systemized innovation that we can have. So that's why people, like, like massive organizations as well, not just councils, like, um, IBM are recruiting like 10,000 service designers over the next few years or something. There aren't 10,000 service designers in the world, by the way. <laughs> um, so like they, they're looking for innovative practices and design for people that aren't designers is an innovative sort of practice. Mm -hmm. um, so that's why, that's why they, they need it. Yeah. I mean, I could just call myself an innovator, but that would scare people. So service design is a little bit softer, mm. I think. Mm. So it's almost how you brand yourself, how you brand your with that particular label. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe I should call myself an innovator. What do you think, guys? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but then with every uh, sort of discipline comes the debate of how do we understand this discipline? Mm. And for example, graphic design is full of debates on what is graphic design. Mm. You know, RCA is hosting a talk in a couple of weeks time, what is graphic design, what is graphic design education. So, and to me that's highlighting that these things A, cannot be, you know, uh, too specific. And also that even if we try to make them specific, we still don't kind of grasp them. Mm. But I cannot escape that fact that, of course, on a daily basis, we need to answer the phone with some kind of title. Yeah. So you're, you're saying that service design in itself is a specialism. When you were talking about it, you're, you were saying, oh, I might do a bit of this, might do a bit of that. Don't you feel that service design, in a way, if you want saying that specialisms are a good thing, isn't a specialism, really? Because like, when do you stop specialising if there are so many specialisms within it? Like the graphics bit, and you were saying well, stuff like that. I'm not, I'm not a specialist at graphics. Really, I'm not. I'll just do a bit to make sure that whatever I deliver as a service designer is good enough. So I'm specialising in service design as in the whole thing, but also especially within service design, those co-design sessions and like customer journey mapping, like those two skills I think are quite specific to service design. So if I, if I get really, really amazing at those, then I'll be a really, really good service designer. And the other stuff is, I'm not specialising in it, I'm just using it to support my work. Does that, does that answer your question? Yeah. 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 <laughs> another person back there. Um, I'm really interested in what you were saying about labeling mm. practice. And I wanted to know what you think about the fact that in CSM, in graphic design, um, in the second year, we're split up into moving image, illustration, and design interaction, and advertising, to the point where when I like, meet one of my friends from a different pathway, within graphic design, they'll say, I'm an advertising, or I'm a moving image. So like, we're being labeled still at u university. So I was just wondering what you think about that in the wider picture of graphic design. Yeah, well, I, I think if you look at this college, for example, you're still responding to briefs by doing across mediums. But also, that's, for example, the institution's way of telling you that this is your area of focus. This is what we're selling you, you know. this is. It's communicating not only to you, but it's also communicating to outsiders that these are areas people usually end up from here. But then, to me, it's still about 
how you see yourself and how you define yourself. You know, nobody cares if you graduated from illustration if you want to do something else. You know, they're not going to look at your CV that you cannot work in advertising because you did illustration at CSN. So to me, to a certain extent, again, it's it's a label that is kind of irrelevant. Well, so you find that? Mm, I, I think it's unhappy with InDesign interaction because yeah. I feel like it is so multidisciplinary. Mm. And I find myself and my peers doing like animation and illustration within our project. Mm. But when I talk to some people within, they may be like advertising and <coughs> the image, much more we only do advertising mm. or we only do drawing or illustration. Mm. So I, don't know, it's quite I feel like design and interaction is closer to what you were talking about being this graphic designer. Yeah, but again, it's kind of, if I call to an illustrator and as commissioner, I give them a brief and I don't get an illustration at the end of the day, I'm going to be quite fucked to be said. <laughs> but then, again, it's what's that process and what's that communication between, between us and what needs to happen in that state. But again, to me, the decision of for example, do I commission that illustration in the first place? Has come before, you know. And we often, to my mind, operate in a fixed set of things where, because we've always done things like this, that's how we go about things. And like I said, it's, it's pretty difficult for me to start saying that graphic designers should not keep on designing logos as a default when companies ask for deep logos. But I think that's the world that is actually kind of ruining us. Because we are set to these defaults, you know. I'm a logo designer, therefore I only deliver logos, and that's what people buy from me, you know. But this whole debate underlies the structure that you cannot put everybody in the same box, you know. Somebody is very happy doing one niche thing, and somebody is not, you know. But to my mind, we live in a complex system where we need to understand beyond this. You know, if you graduate from DNI, you need to understand how illustration works, how illustrators work. Illustrators need to understand, for example, what's the commissioning process when you deal with a designer. You know, how, how, do, how do these interactions operate? You know? And also, where does the discipline go if you're only looking at the history and this is how we've been doing it? I'm only going to copy that and keep doing that so same. Maybe what we need to do is kind of, as designers, like educate like the people that are commissioning us mm. to allow us to have the space to potentially try out designing other things other than what we've been set to do and then like explain to them how we've looked at their, their needs and we've found another thing that that we could design that would meet those needs as well or better mm. like is that something that you think is a good tactic yeah well that's exactly how i feel about <laughs> it but i think the biggest problem there is again because it's Businesses are based on moving money, for example. So lots of, lots of, lots of work gets done simply because money goes around and people need to be busy doing stuff, you know. And you were saying something about, uh, you know, design can change the world. I don't think design changes shit, people do, you know. <laughs> so people change the world design and it's about, yeah, design is a tool. Yeah. It, but, the, you know, for example, if I say design as a problem, Solver, designer is also a problem creator. You know, that's true. Our our problems today are to uh, sorry our <laughs> solutions today are tomorrow's problems. You know, and this is <laughs> well, look at anything. Look at energy. Look at all these things. We we only creating next day's problems, but because we are so keen on fixing today's things, you know, we're kind of I, lost I in the process. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> oh, um, something about you as well. I, I graduated from Goldsmiths in design, BA design, and all of us have found it really hard to pitch ourselves. So, like, there have been a few people that have pitched themselves really well. They've always known exactly what like area within design they can do the best. They're fine. Most of the rest of us are still kind of like working out what it is that we actually want to do within design, and that makes it harder for us to go for specific jobs. Um, when you're talking about pitching, kind of uh, like you said, kind of specialising in something almost gives you kind of like 
a pitch to kind of say to this company, this is what I do, do you have anything that I that you need me to do? Um, kind of in, in, say for example, the movie industry, especially people who are at the top of their game, they have a very set specialism. They do that job and they do not stray either side of it. But then again, we have kind of creatives at the top of their industry like Thomas Heatherwick or Paul Smith who dip and dive into loads of other things. Do you think that in terms of kind of, if, if your ultimate aim is to really make it in the business, do you reckon go down the approach of multidisciplinary or specialism? I reckon you should go down that approach which you like the best because you'll do the best at what you enjoy. So, and also, Thomas Heatherwick and uh, Paul Smith are really cool guys, but remember they have a whole agency of people mm. supporting them. So, Thomas Heatherwick probably didn't make any of the prototypes for the because well, he maybe he did, but he probably didn't make everything, you mm. know. So, he'll have an idea and he'll get someone else to do it. And you know, like, especially Zaha Hadid, infamous, she does a squiggle. Everyone else does her work. So, like, but yeah, if you want to be successful, just do what you love doing. That's like. <laughs> yes, please. Do you think um, in the future there will be a sway in business or companies that they would require um, a designer that can do a lot of different things, or do you think um, that it would be specialisms, or do you think it will always be that some companies like to have in-house designers that can do a lot, or do it's, you think it's approach and budget? And at the moment, I'm working as a freelancer with a lady in a startup where she's got so little budget that I have to do all the different kinds of design that need being that need done. So like all the graphics, like user experience, like just everything that needs done. I'm the only designer. So then yeah, like in that case when there's not mon much money, you have to play everything. But then I guess like yeah, it depends on the approach as well. So I guess you, it, it's possible maybe to have larger organisations where you have multidisciplinary designers, but I guess that would work better in a team of people anyway. I mean, there is also the saying, um, jack of all trades and master of none, isn't there? I mean, there is, yeah. is there something to be said for focusing on something really specific and doing that for 10 years and becoming really great at it? Or is that a model that is outdated? I don't know. What? My argument is, for example, if I look at publishing, yeah. it, it's like people are so focused on, for example, their mediums that they forget the how, how do how we communicate, yeah. how do we yeah. fit in. And if, for example, we've had last week, I found really good digital designers in technical skills, yeah. building stuff, but they don't know how to read a newspaper, what article relates where. How, how do you communicate, you know? So if you get too in depth of your specialism, you mm. can't not operate with mm. the rest because you're not designing in a vacuum and you need to understand what the next person is doing. Yeah, yeah. So and that also has to adapt. Yeah. Well. yeah. Yes, please. Um, by being labeled service design, have you ever um, got to, like any like regrets about a project that didn't fit about service design? But that would fit you? Like, do you feel blocked by being labelled? Do I feel blocked by being labelled, and do I have regrets about service, about any projects I've done? Uh, Does it block you the labelling? Is it? Has it ever worked I still against you? For some reason, I still get asked to do graphics all the time. So like, even though I say I'm a service designer, people give me graphics work, like, which just doesn't make sense. I don't know why. But you do do uh, it. Yeah. You yeah. do the graphics. I do it because it's paid. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so are you a service designer or a I do, do you still do the graphics set? Yeah, but I'm a service I think Because I'm aren't you limiting service. yourself by just saying, Oh yeah, I'm a service designer, but I do do graphics <laughs> if you want me to. <laughs> I'll take the work, you know. Well I'm yeah. like, I'm only two years out of uni, so I'm still building my reputation and my career. So at the moment I need to just say yes to the money wherever it's coming. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I'm, that's true. So, yeah, but couldn't you call yourself a graphic designer? I don't ever call myself a graphic designer. I say I'm a service designer, here's my portfolio. It has some graphics in it to show that I can. And then I end up getting graphics work. <laughs> because there are, there's more graphics work going around than service design at the moment. So I'm really fighting to get more service design jobs out there. Somebody back there. But why would you just say, yes, I'm a graphic designer as well? if that's where you're saying a lot of the money is anyway. Because you could be saying, yes, I'm a service designer, and I'm a graphic designer. 
because if I say that I'm a graphics designer, I'll end up getting too many graphics jobs and I will get distracted from my true path, which is to be a service designer. Well, what's wrong with that? Just say no to them or are you like, is that really a bad thing that you're getting so many briefs to the door? <laughs> <laughs> My argument would be that there is this illusion that works comes, work comes to you. Work doesn't come to you. Mm. You go to the work, you know. And if you are a graphic designer, for example, who wants to design in a social realm and not do simply visuals, I think is completely capable of operating under an umbrella of graphic designer and go to those jobs because you're anyway going to have lots of dialogues explaining who you are and what you do if you're going to work with somebody. And for example, I've given up on the idea of you know, people calling me and wanting jobs because they've seen my portfolio online or something. I don't, I've got all my jobs from a pub, pretty much. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Seriously. Yeah. I agree with that. I think networking is how I've got all of my stuff out Yeah, but for example, uh, with service design, again, now it's it's a name that we hear around, and it's something that sells stuff. You know, you can <coughs> sell yourself saying that you're a service designer. For example, uh, Goldsmith started a couple of years ago a course called Meta Design. Mm. Anybody know what's Meta Design? Method. Meta. Meta, Meta, Meta design. design. So they. A couple really? of years. Is that an MA course? It was. Two years after, it's called something else. Mm. And this is also the problem of we live in a world where we, especially in the institutions, just need to change for the sake of changing and looking that we're up to date. But mm. we are moving so fast that everything changes in an accelerating space or speed. So, for example, <laughs> you know, maybe it's not always about the problem of, you know, being specific, it's yeah. about the, those specific changes too much. That was interesting what Lior was saying earlier on that a goldsmith, the BA is just called BA design, mm. and that that you know that kind of openness and freedom, I guess, works for some people really well, but other people just kind of go, oh help, how yeah. how who am I? How I'm positioning myself? Mm. So no, like, do you guys like to be in a specific route, or would you prefer being on a course that's called design? Yeah. But you I think it's wrong to box you in so yeah. early. 
What do you think? I, I feel completely the same as well. I feel like we have been pushed into a rut. And I feel like with the baristas sometimes, even though they are catered for DNI, I sometimes feel, think about like other outcomes. I think it should, we shouldn't be limited to what the outcome should be. Because I find myself stressing about, oh, what is DNI? What fits? Like within this specialism, I feel like I can't branch out mm -hmm. to other things that I feel would answer the brief better. Or, and I want to learn all those skills. I don't want to be, like, I'm still interested in illustration and moving image completely, and I'd love to learn that further, mm -hmm. but I feel like I can't. Mm -hmm. You know what? I actually really relate to what you're saying because I did two years on furniture and product design in Nottingham Trent. And I was like, is this it? Yeah. <laughs> and then I, I, I did choose Goldsmiths where they didn't define what design was at all. So, you know what? I, I guess I did have that experience. Yeah. And it was good. <laughs> so, but you know, you can learn about things about other disciplines, like in your own time as well. Yeah. Can they go to other tutors as well for help? I don't know. There's not. Really? It doesn't really happen that much, does it? it Once is. you're in the root, you're in the root. The answer is yes. Really, it's a yes, but it's not always necessary. And I think the reason that it's not always necessary for our class to be and I sort of focusing on what you think the expectations of BNI are, which actually don't necessarily exist. And I think if you look at a range of the briefs, they tend not to be outside. I don't think we, we set a single brief which is outcome oriented. They're all about a process that you're engaging in, and, and the, the result of those are of a really broad spectrum that allows you to wander into the environment, and it allows you to fall into the area of illustration. So what I'm more intrigued about is how you craft your own path. And I think that can only happen if you don't assume that design and interaction is a box, that you actually assume that it's more of a structure that's going to help guide you a little bit. But not, it's not walls, it's, it's more of a path. Can I say in between? Mm -hmm. I think you highlight the problem that communication happens not by who sends it out, but the receiver at that end and of course we try to define for example i talk to you and i hope you somewhat understand i don't probably have to understand half of what i'm saying now because I'm <laughs> too too lack of sleep but anyway uh point is uh that we can be slightly controlled but for example writing a curriculum it's still up to you to define how you understand it and how you use it and for example, hearing that you need to do this kind of thing, this is St. Martin's, you can do whatever. It's about you understanding that in order to do whatever, you need to be standing behind the work and be able to explain why you've done what you've done, you know. It's not about, you know, doing that bloody poster or a logo. Uh, and I think so these guys will be a lot more responsive to you pushing the boundaries. Like I was at Nottingham Trent on a furniture course and I designed an invisible man bag for a brief, and they just didn't get it. <laughs> so, like, it, I think they'd be impressed if you push things more than. Mm. Like, There's somebody who's going to speak it for yeah. work. Um, I, I agree with Kara. I don't think briefs, at least in DNI, are like, like that specific <coughs> to mm. the outcome. Like, I know personally, my outcomes haven't been like D and I, like printed, whatever. Yeah. But, like, I think you can do whatever you want. You just have mm. to decide that you're going to do whatever you want. Yeah. And I mean, then, like, the tutors accept Yeah. It. I've only been here four years, so this is my second year here in, in this department. So I don't know the other pathways at all, really. I don't know how they get taught. But just my impression, and I, I don't know, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, is that, like, moving image, illustration, advertising, to me, those three sound relatively narrow. But to me, d and I sounds like, do what you want, you know? And it's not that you can't use moving image in response to a DNI brief, or you can't, it's not that you can't use illustration in response to a DNI brief. Yeah, but again, for example, moving image, what is moving image? Yeah. You know, it's not screen based. Moving image as a definition does not mean anything that it needs to be on screen. Mm -hmm. It's about people themselves defining that because I'm doing moving image, I must use a screen or yeah. a computer, you know? So it's. So that, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> so, I mean, Kira, maybe, what do you think is the benefit of us specialising as we can do anything? Wouldn't it be beneficial to still let us, as in first year, choose briefs from all around? Or perhaps it would be for those people who need to think about what they really want to do? Mm, I think, it, you know, it's a, it's a really good question. And it's one that I think the, the course is debating itself, mm -hmm. as well as the students that are in it. 
uh, and th there's no one person that has the, the right answer. There isn't a right answer for a question like that. I think there's, there's a, 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 a way of thinking that perhaps tries to resolve this a little bit. Um, personally, I think that if, if we didn't have the, the roots and the areas of specialisms, I think a lot of students would get lost mm. and that you'd end up floating. Um, and I think what is helpful when you're leaving a course and going out into an industry is to have uh, some direction which you've found in yourself. But for you to find a direction, you need somebody there mm -hmm. pushing you along the way. Um, if we have a, a, a free floating course where people can move around all over the place, you're not necessarily having the guidance and the pushing from certain members of staff who get to know all of your projects, for instance, or uh, you, you, there may be a bit of avoidance as well. Uh, you know, I can think of a number of students right now that I'm sure would avoid those typography briefs and, and head off towards illustration to just move and avoid things. And I think it's really interesting when we get students that we're not jamming them into a pathway and saying, this is what we expect you to do. We want you to have this type of portfolio when you're leaving. We don't have any of that within any of the routes. Um, what we do have is, let's you know, and we encourage you to think about uh, approaches that are appropriate to an area of specialism. But that specialism, as you said, design and interaction is incredibly broad. Mm -hmm. And I think this is why it's a really key debate to have now for you guys. You've already had to go through one stage of decision making. And the chances are you're going to have to go through quite a few other stages of decision making. And sometimes the decision may be to not make a decision. Uh, that's entirely up to you. But you're, you're the people that, that are, you're defining your own path, your own route. You know, don't see it as a box and, and we're making the decisions for you. I don't make the decision when I write my brief as to what you're going to do as a result of it. I write the brief to give you room to play and all tutors do, you to play and sort of discover something about the way that you work, which hopefully will mean that some of you will end up specializing as we all have done. But some of you, We'll do the lessons done and say, actually, I do this and I can apply myself in a number of ways. And that's what I mean, that there's no right or wrong way. And I don't really think having uh, no roots is going to be helpful in either of those directions. I think we'll end up with a number of students who've got a little bit of this and a little bit of that and a little bit of that. And actually, when, we, when they go to leave and we say, what are you going to do? They're going to go, I don't know. I'm all right at this, I've got a little bit of that. Mm. I don't know really what that means. But then that, that's a problem of personal interest. That's not a problem of, that's mm. a, about the person being capable of defining what they want to do. Yeah. And you could be in a really specific thing or completely broad, and that still will happen you know, yes. in an educational context. But uh, for example, here, I think graphic design to me is an umbrella, you know, and then illustrators. I think illustrators are graphic designers to me. You know, you're doing visual communication, which is not always even limited to just visuals. But for example, I'd rather work with a person who not just labels them as an illustrator and can do only one thing, but is, for example, somebody who sees them as a very illustrative person who understands about typography, who understands about for example, three-dimensional space, pages, uh, scale, contrast, basics, you know. This, if, take fundamentals, for example, of visual design, and they apply everywhere. So, you know, I don't see any sort of mm. differentiation. Yeah, yeah. I think, I think, well, did you also want to say something, Green Hat? No, did you have your, that was me. Yeah, that's you, but there was somebody else about five minutes ago in that area as well, I saw a hand. Is that you? No, okay. Sorry. I was just because I think the one thing that I've like missed in the first year is probably the learning because I, I I did straight out of GCSE my teacher art teacher was as was trained to graphic designer she was like oh I do graphic design mm. did graphic design like went into <coughs> foundation and did graphic design I didn't think about the possibilities of like moving image and illustration it's just like I feel that like I need another year to like figure out where I am because I'm in DNI. I agree it is the broadest and you can do a lot of stuff, but I'm missing the learning from like illustration, moving image, advertising, things like that, that I feel could benefit me. Well, I think, I mean, you've just said you, you feel like you need another year to figure out who you are. Yeah. I think, you know, I, 
I sometimes still think that. I think <laughs> if I was given the option, I would procrastinate making decisions forever. Yeah. I think it's, I, I completely am an advocate of labels actually, because I think labels to me personally, and different people react differently to labels. For me personally, I like coming up, I like having, thinking about borders and then um, rubbing up against them. I think that's a really, for me, that's a really kind of interesting creative um, place to be to kind of push against boundaries and I think and see what happens when you push and and pull and push your boundaries into other areas and I think I for me that is a fruitful process I think if I were if I'd been on a course that would have been called design I would have been lost I would have been like oh who am I and I've had three years of kind of existential hell which a lot of them did <laughs> which um, lots of people do Sorry, Beth. Yes, I just like to point out about one thing. Too. I studied a diploma back in Singapore for like three years, and I came to like Europe now. But I have no clue what I want to do, so that's kind of why I went to university to try to figure out some more. Mm -hmm. One thing about labeling and spec like being like being able to like specialize in something, like isn't it like if you bring it out to like the working world, isn't it more reliable? If you, like if I was if I do illustration, and then if I if like the client wants to find someone like the illustration outcome, I'll find. A luxury firm mm. instead of being like, oh, I do graphic design mm. in general, but then like we specialize in things. Isn't like specializing <coughs> and labeling what's how it works? Yeah, mm. how it works. Yeah. A lot yeah. of the time. <laughs> <laughs> I think, yeah, yes. like, what do you want to just say that I do graphic design and I specialize in <coughs> servicing? Mm. What do you mean? Because they're and different. You get, you know, to be honest, I would love to just say I'm a service designer and nothing else, mm -hmm. but that, as I said, it's still a new industry, so um, we're all fighting for jobs in it. Mm -hmm. If I could just do service design and not do any graphics, I'd be happier. <laughs> How do you feel about graphic, graphic design? design. Oh, sorry, sorry. Yeah, it's just a quick question. Do you think um, they will get jobs? They help because you don't have to have so many discussions beforehand. <laughs> <laughs> That labels probably help when you communicate to people who have absolutely no, no idea who you are and what you do, you know. Suddenly when you have a fancy title, it sounds fancy and you believe in other people. The more you work, the more you start to realize that people just come up with fancy titles and they mean shit. And all you care is that people actually know what they're doing. So. Yeah. I had that experience, I used to work in a company and then uh, my title was Creative content engineer. <laughs> which, means, like, which means nothing. Which means nothing to me. Yeah, I, I, I was in a meeting a couple of weeks ago with the person who had a certain title, then I got an email next week, and that title had changed to something else <laughs> based on that project. So I just know that they renamed themselves to sound more convincing on emails. <laughs> you know. And actually, if I say I'm a graphic designer, the title on my work pass as just designer. So. so would you say this is why portfolios are so important? Because it gives them an insight into what you actually do rather than what you say you are? Yeah, well I think at the end of the day, no matter how your portfolio for example looks, it's about you being able to deliver and operate in that realm. So for example, with online or generally using computers, we can all do nice looking stuff. But not everybody is a good designer, you know. So I think it's very much about, you know, how we look at things. But of course, I'm not saying that if you have a really remarkable looking portfolio, for example, that's not a really good entry point to somewhere. Of course it is, you know. Do you, you think it's odd that uh, we didn't get interviewed for this place at St. Martin's? Or I didn't really send something to my... Well, if I... Actually, last week, <laughs> looked at my portfolio that I used to apply here. I really think you can see lots of my personality on the writing, and you can see lots of my personality in the work. And then you can see that there's lots of things that were completely all over the place. And I, the, the reason why I applied to study was that I knew that I need to study more to mm. go somewhere. And I think we always develop, you know, you don't graduate and be finished. You know, you die and you're still not finished. You're learning and, you know. And that's also the part of, to
to me as sort of labeling problem is that world changes so fast that I've come across with so many people who are like, well, this is what I studied, this is what I am, and now I've, it's already changed, but you know, I can't let go because I really just want to be sticking into that title, for example. And then you go around and tell everybody else how they're doing <coughs> things wrong because you got it right. So when I, when I graduated, my title was designer slash superhero. And <laughs> I, it's still my business card. <laughs> but I, it's only after I graduated and learned more through experience that I find that service design fits what I do best right now. So like, even though you might feel like, I need to know exactly what I'm doing by the time I graduate, don't worry, Like, actually, sometimes none of us know what we're doing, and you carry on learning as well. Uh, I have a friend who, his business card says, art, art dictator, <laughs> because he basically has decided that, A, he knows what he wants to do with his work, is in a place where he can pretty much work with a lot of people he wants to work with, so he doesn't need to direct anything, he can just dictate. <laughs> no, but again, that gives a funny tone, you understand that this guy yeah, yeah. understands about communication and he yeah. understands that it's not about that fancy title. So. I, I just want to ask you what you think, you know, you, you've talked about design and interaction being uh, a specialism, something you plan to do, but what does it mean, you know, do you think graphic? graphic design is a specialism in itself, or do you think the course should be designed? Because that's sort of a similar question, slightly broader. The graphic design is definitely a specialism. Like, it's a broad one. Like, obviously, visual communication spans a lot of things. But I feel things like product design are different. You're creating, you're looking at, like, ergonomics of design, different things, whereas you're not really visually communicating communicating anything, mm -hmm. if that makes sense. I don't I don't do agree with that. Really? Like, I think graphic design can do product design, and some product designers, we do things that we communicate, like some objects that way things, because I thought about, like, but that goes back to, like, social design slash service design, like, everything's connected, and, like... Actually, product designers need to draw things really, really well, because a lot of the time they don't make their product. But that end, end product, though, yeah. Yeah. Harry? Um, I don't think we necessarily need to label it, but just have more cross-course collaboration. Like, we, we're all saying that we'd love to kind of do more illustration. We're all saying, like, I mean, personally, I'd love to work with some product design students. I'd love to work with, I know, some fashion, some textiles, some you know, people who do lots of other things. I think, like, before I came here, I read the prospectus. I thought, this is perfect. This is exactly the kind of curriculum that would suit me. The only thing I would change is just interacting with other things that I don't necessarily do, but I'd like to kind of interact with and find out more about. Yeah. Yeah. No, it doesn't have to be like in the curriculum. Yeah. No. Exactly. Yeah. Just do it. Yeah. So you're doing, you're doing a course called graphic communication design. Does that mean you're happy to say that you're graphic communication designer? Yeah. Is, but the graphic design itself is like meta discipline. It mm -hmm. expands beyond graphic mm -hmm. itself. Yeah. Like yeah. you used to think about it in the mm -hmm. like print era, like print media era. Now this, you don't sh think about the graphic just in terms of goods, newspapers. You think in terms of moving image. Mm -hmm. You you think about uh, web design, coding, processing, and so on. So we. Graphic design touched so many things, skills. To a certain extent, if you look at, go back on history of fine art, mm -hmm. fine art is a commodity. <laughs> it didn't exist like it exists in modern mm -hmm. world. It was the same thing. It was just communicating someone's ideas, not usually your own. It was churches or the states or whatever, whoever was commissioning you. Mm -hmm. And you were visually communicating things. Or you did music, but you know, very few people were in the realm of I just do whatever I want, or you have to be really rich or really, really poor not to care. <laughs> you know. But point is, the world has moved on, and now we have something which is kind of called similarly than it was before, and it operates in a different way. And I think that's happening to graphic design as well, that mm. because we don't live in a sort of really fixed uh, 
mechanical world where I'm defined by all these actions. I know how I do. You know, I'm defined by my thoughts and how I speak and exactly. who I interact with. That's why I don't so. think that we should have more and more more narrow labels. Yeah, but for example, you mentioned IDO, and if I go to IDO's website, I kind of now go and think like, really? The only reason you operate like this is that you label a design thinking as a new thing to sell to companies. But they're really, really the new innovation in design thinking. What IDO, for example, is pushing. I'm kind of asking, where is it anymore? You know, the, like in, in general, like to me, if I look at it's just an advertising agency just selling different content to companies. You know, people love to spend money on stuff that. They don't even understand what it is. <laughs> and I think that's really going on with all the Yeah. But if you look, genius if you look at branding design. agencies, yeah. there's I I just heard was it Wolf Olens that something like eighty percent of their work that's never realized. But it's just business spending money on stuff that they want to see options of what could we do, mm -hmm. what's out there. Or project takes so much time that once it's done, it's already dated, and you can't go with it. You know. So I mean, we can still find the good stuff in what idea was saying about design thinking and mm. apply it in our own practice. We don't have to emulate exactly what. Well, is it design doing. thinking or is it just thinking? You know. Yeah. <laughs> well, it's a design process, and it's about meeting user needs. And I don't think that. Well, at the moment, I can't think of any other kind of discipline which looks at user needs in that way and creatively problem solves. Mm. So for me, it's still the best way of talking about it. Mm. Well then. You also use the term social design. So, for example, how you define between social design and service design? I, it must have been, I didn't even realize I was a social designer today, but I guess um, before I thought of myself as more of a social designer. I might have got it off your website or somewhere. Right, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, before I thought, okay, well, I'm just going to take projects which have a social aim. And I guess I still do that. Really, so I, de I design services which are social. Like that's why I haven't gone to work for Coke or something so far. Yeah, <laughs> but, but for example, uh, there's been lots of debate: who should you work with and who should you not work with? And it kind of goes to me as the same. Like Coca-Cola as a brand is so broad that it actually kind of enable stuff to happen yeah. and, and there was a project called Color Life for example some years ago when people realized that there's problems of getting medicine to places in the world but yet Coca-Cola can go to those places yeah. so how is this possible yeah. and if you're only looking at you know the medicine distribution you're not going to get to the yeah. solution yeah. but if you're looking at distribution in general and what's getting moved around and then they came up with an idea of packaging the medicine in a way that it can travel with the Coke bottles. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah, but you're not arriving to that situation if you're only limiting yourself to this sort of, this is mm. how mm. we operate in this little realm, you know. Oh, well, as I said, like, I flex through time. Yeah. I guess I'm just reacting to my environment. Yeah, yeah. I guess my core value is to make the world a better place through using design as a tool. Mm. And Let, that's beautiful. <laughs> Shall we end with that? <laughs> we need to wrap it up. Mm. Um, so thank you very much.